Hi everyone, thank you for joining us tonight for Decolonizing the Colorado River. Can we rethink our relationship with water? Um, tonight we're gonna be learning about the history of water rights and infrastructure in Arizona and thinking about how that's impacted Native nations and informed our relationship with water. The Climate Conversations, for those of you who are just joining us, is a program series hosted by Arizona Humanities, um, the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Arizona Humanities supports public programs that promote understanding of the human experience with cultural, educational, and nonprofit organizations across Arizona. And this program is made possible by funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And again, for those of you who are just tuning into our program series for the first time, we take Q&A um, at the end of the program. So if you have any questions for Dr. Curley, who I'll be introducing in just a moment, um, you can put them in the chat, which should be to the right of your screen. You will need to join using your Google account. So if you don't have a Google account, you can use that um, Google form that's linked in the description below. And I'll also put it in the chat in a second. And we'll get to those questions at the end of the presentation. Um, but I'd like to introduce our speaker now. Andrew Curley is an assistant professor in the School of Geography, Development, and Environment at the University of Arizona. Dr. Curley's research focuses on the everyday incorporation of indigenous nations into colonial economies. Building on ethnographic research, his publications speak to how indigenous communities understand coal, energy, land, water, infrastructure, and development in an era of energy transition and climate change. We are really excited to have Dr. Curley here today, and without further ado, I will hand it over to him. Great, thank you. trying to uh, give you a sense of some of the longer historical issues that indigenous nations face uh, today in Arizona. So the Colorado River is an abstraction. It is physically defining. It defines Arizona's western border, creating real political barriers between California and Nevada. Within colonial law, rivers are much more than rivers. They are the forecasted annual flows the bases for rights of diversion, which in turn are the foundations for past, present, and future economies. Geographers and others define rivers sometimes in expansive areas called basins, which include tributaries that eventually flow into larger river systems. This comprehensive appreciation for rivers is different from understanding the environment according to local ecologies, of, or sustainable economies built on centuries of limited, minute, and often bounded environmental observations. In the past, indigenous environmental sciences did not limit rivers to basins or categorize them within systems. As with observations of the land, traditional knowledge was based on a different episteme or a different theory of knowledge or how we come to learn about things that we know one that included land, animals, plants, and other kinds of life. Although these are also topics of environmental sciences, our academic division of labor, labor sorry, an emphasis on specialization, cause us to focus on narrow questions at the expense, expense of holistic, social, cultural, and political considerations. This presentation draws on environmental history to rethink how we understand climate crises in the Southwest, particularly around questions of drought and climate change along the Colorado River. So much of the crisis is presented without history, looking to toward a not too distant far, a not too far distant apocalypse in the future. Indigenous researchers like Menominee scholar Kyle White argues that our apocalypse is actually in the past our worlds and environments were made, remade around us in ways worse than the most dire predictions of climate change. White asks, what is worse than the flooding of a dam, 
the violent removal from ancestral lands to foreign ones, the kidnapping of children from homes to boarding schools. If we think through the, a longer historical understanding of tribes and their access to water, including the tributaries of the Colorado River, we see a longer history of denial, diversion, and damage. Much of this was accomplished through the making of law, new political institutions, and concrete barriers featured in my title slide here. This is actually a photo I took driving over Lake Mead, um, sorry, Lake Powell near Page, Arizona. In the fall of 2021, water levels in two major reservoirs, Lake Mead and Lake Powell, declined to historic lows, triggering the Bureau of Reclamation to issue mandatory reduction in water use to the lower basin states, primarily Arizona. Resources such as water become markers of today's climate emergency. Unexamined in this discourse is the role of dams and reservoirs in generating dramatic social and environmental change. For indigenous nations, damming of perennial water systems was world changing, as much as lines on a map demarcate settler space from traditional homelands, dams become the concrete manifestations of colonial ambitions, complete with ontologies of nature and space and ideologies of progress and modernization that amplify colonial difference, racial capitalism, and concretize settler colonialism. In other words, it's a way we perceive the environment, it's a way we think and understand the environment around us, which gives us the motivation and the, the ideologies and, and political frameworks on, upon that we use in order to change it. And I'll go more into detail about how that happens, especially here in Arizona. The transformation of the landscape is one of dystopia for indigenous nations. Arizona has 22 federally recognized tribes whose lands and access to water have all been dramatically impacted by settlers over the last 150 years. The maxim first in use, first in right, foundational to much of Western water law, was established in the Colorado, or during the, sorry, not the Colorado, the California Gold Rush, a murderous event that witnessed both genocide and environmental rampage. At first, it was a loose agreement among some of these uh, pillagers. Uh, those who first lay claim to a water source got priority claims to it. From the beginning, the logic was tied to extraction and exploitation of the earth from the, for the, uh, for, from the destruction of the environments for profits. Mining camps established these forms of laws that were both anti-Indian and based on evolving shared understanding about what was, quote, public domain and the rights that followed discovery. It is long assumed that the riparian system of water law was rejected because, at least rejected in the Western states, because of water scarcity. That too little water existed to satisfy industrial use of water, so, uh, so, so, so might as well provide enough water to the few industries that can develop it, namely the first claimants onto the water source. However, looking at older accounts on the evolution of water law in the West, Wheel, uh, one of the authors I was looking at, this is from a 1911 text, adds that the riparian system was based on English common law and a way to ensure water to disparate users or different users despite ancient uh, claims to property or ancient property rights. You know, and if you go back into the history of feudalism in Europe, uh, you had especially in England, you had ideas of commons that were eventually enclosed upon. Uh, and so these people's settlements long uh, pre-existed uh, or it pri existed prior to the establishment of water law under the riparian system, which allowed them to have a, more of a stake and an interest in it. However, in the case of California, the land was viewed as empty, indigenous presence erased, Consequently, land and water could be divided as property rights to the pillagers who came to mine it. The doctrine of prior appropriation spread from California as, as a territory and then a state to the territories surrounding it. It was the only water law in the region and courts from Nevada to Colorado that, oh, wait, it was, the only, it was the only water law in the region and courts from Nevada to Colorado adopted it. Another notion that emerged out of the California mining camp and that eventually was key 
to the quantification of water in the West was the notion of the acre foot. I don't know if you've ever heard this in the kind of the everyday dialogue on the crisis of the Colorado River, but the acre foot is referred to one acre of land flooded with a foot of water. That's what the measurement is referring to, about 325,851 gallons. Um, that's a lot of water. The acre foot of water was imagined for mining exploitation, but eventually became the dominant metric by which water is measured and quantified. It transformed from a mining logic to an agricultural one early in California state history, which eventually went into Arizona state history. The acre foot a year was a new temporal, or the way we understand time, understanding of water. It became central for both hydrological studies and legal political rights. The acre foot is measured by a calendar year and not by any time frame a, ro a river might recognize, which goes uh, epochs, even before human presence <laughs> in the region. The acre foot put water systems and the movement of rivers, both in time and space and volume, into imperfect colonial time frames. As states across the West adopted water codes that mimicked California and then Colorado, the surveying of water for the purpose of development and rights became critically important. In 1872, Congress passed a mining law that protected miners' appropriation of public lands and water, suggesting that these activities served some broader public use. During the infamous, I don't know how infamous it is today, <laughs> during the infamous 13th Territorial Legislature, I'm sure all of you know what I'm talking about, in 1885, Representative C.C. Stevens passed legislation that abolished riparian rights in the territory while establishing the University of Arizona, where I work, as the land-grant institution. Up until this year, the first in use, first in right principle was central, uh, from this year onward, uh, that principle was central to Arizona water law. So you see how that logic got incorporated into how uh, we understand water today, and it's the basis upon which we think and measure climate crises in some ways. The ideology of environmental transformation for primarily white settlement is evidence in the state seal, which highlights dams, cash crop agriculture, mining, and, and uh, cattle. And you can even see or read the description of the seal in, on the left-hand side. And in the, in the foreground, you have a, a miner who's clearly uh, phenotypically white and a man, so it's a gendered form of labor, leaning on an ax and a shovel with uh, uh, perfectly planted rows, so it's uh, s suggesting cash crop ag agriculture, not sustainable agriculture or traditional forms of agriculture, and cattle in the background. And you can clearly, clearly see in the background of the, the, the picture uh, a dam that's holding back water and creating a reservoir. And um, what's always funny for me when I'm reading this is that the, uh, the motto is in um, Latin, which is uh, not English, um, despite the fact that the legislature passed an English-only law. But, you know, so <laughs> the seal is actually um, in, in, out of compliance of the law that was passed. Um, so the, a, lot, a lot of this... Um, represented in the seal is referring to like kind of this ideology in progress, the way um, in development, the way people started to understand the environment and thinking about the new territories that they were claiming. And moving on into 1902, federal government, along with the prodding of a lot of Western states, passes the Reclamation Act, which was a basis of the Bureau of Reclamation <coughs> and funded a lot of surveying of river systems, tributaries, in an effort to know where, uh, to identify places to dam and create reservoir. Reclamation and an assumed aridness, uh, settlers that came into the region viewed the West as a desert. And this was foundational to their transformation of the West. Their understanding of these regions is based on a colonial inva and invasive ontology and a, a different way of viewing the natural world around them. To the see the world as one's right to remake and to remake it in the reflection of ecologies from the East and perhaps, sorry microphone, in the memory of Europe in the minds of settlers, uh, settlers came in and view and, and try to create concrete manifestations of these ideas, which would be the dams and the canalways and 
um, and then eventually as cities that we, where we inhabit. Indigenous peoples are often critiqued as being idealistic or that our politics are examples of idealism. But when looking at how the Colorado River was divided, it started with ideals and idealisms. Vague quotes about making the river work for settlement. Idealism reflected in um, the previous slide. Uh, and crucially, it was made possible through the way scientists measured the water, put data toward regimes of quantification, and later the engineering involved in dam making. The sheer labor power use that, is, that was part of a, an American racial capitalism and the money coming from settler colonial federal government. And you can see exemplified in this quote how that ontology was being uh, replicated by Roosevelt, the reclamation of unsettled arid public lands. That's the way that he was viewing Arizona. It was not unsettled and it wasn't public lands and it wasn't arid, but these are ideas that are being imprinted onto the landscape. Colonial hydrological science measured annual river flow of the Colorado River starting in 1906, and it was against this idea of aridness and drought. The hydrological studies were funded through the Reclamation Act with the express intent of estimating the river for beneficial and productive use. The early studies were crude, and there were a few points or in fewer points to gather data. Notably, what would become the lower basin of the Colorado River had few river stations measuring water flow compared to what would become the upper basin in this image on the right hand side. Part of the logic and choice of water stations of measurement, as I've come to understand it, is a theory of what lands, rivers, and tributaries contribute to the total of the annual flow of the Colorado River. So because they, the, there were fewer tributaries seen to be coming in and intersecting with the Colorado River in the, what would become the lower basin, fewer monitoring stations were, were gathering data and knowing how much water was coming into the Colorado River. The, this is a, a, a map that I took out of a 1906 um, book. I think the, the um, citation is there on the bottom which was going over a lot of the hydrological estimates of the Colorado River at that time. No, actually, it was, it was published in 1911, sorry. But it was, this is a 1906 um, map that was supplied. And, and on the left-hand side is the kind of water meter, uh, one of the examples of the, 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 the measuring equipment used to try to um, understand how much water was going through the area. What would the river look like starting with indigenous understandings of it? These questions were not asked at the time of colonization. Major accounts of the Colorado River never mention indigenous uses of the river except to casually say something racist and dismissive. Lewis Freeman, who wrote one of the first books after the signing of the Colorado Compact almost 100 years ago today, and the book was called The Colorado River, Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow, <laughs> mentioned indigenous peoples in his book, but relegated them to the background, to the landscape. Here you see Cocopa Nation or Quapa uh, peoples presently near Yuma, Arizona, featured in this text. Their connection to the Colorado River is ancestral. It spans generations before white settlement, but white people are more willing to talk to a tree than an indigenous person when thinking about the history of the environment. <laughs> That's my dig at dendrochronology, sorry. <laughs> but you can see some of the racist language uh, used in the, um, in the text here. And there was a, there, in this book, there's many features. I had to go to the U of A archives to, to find this. It's not you know, something you can pull off the shelf. But there's a lot of images of indigenous peoples, but they're not contributing to the knowledge of the Colorado River here. The Colorado Compact of 1922 that made into legal political fact that miner's measurement of water described earlier, the acre foot feet a year, was also linked to lands that were seen as irrigable. This is a word I have a hard time with. Irrigation and the future course of water became intricately bound in the making of the modern West. Notions of beneficial use became the key negotiating points for dividing the river between the states. The colonial imagination of water was to envision how much of the Colorado River could possibly be deployed to irrigate lands in any of the seven states claiming an interest in it. 
This transformation was then instrumental in how future states thought about water and water use within their territorial claims. It was confirmed in the Colorado Compact as a primary metric by which water would be measured and allocated. These, again, this is that word I'm using, ontological quantifications of water are dissimilar to the ways that indigenous peoples understood the sources of water and the relationship between different kinds of water prior to colonial displacement. Hydrological estimates, a scientific quantification, made the, and scientific quantification made the dividing and pillaging of the river possible. The understanding of water through acre foot, foot a year was stamped onto the understanding and negotiating of the waters of the river in 1922 and onward. This politics of measurement with the Colorado River was then to dam and divert for settlement, quantifying the total among, uh, uh, amount of waters in the river was not an inquiry to learn something about the environment, but to learn something so as to act upon it and change it. Meaning that sometimes our understandings, our cliche notions of science is that we're learning for learning's sake. You know, we're out there to discover new things about the world. But early hydrological science, engineering, hydrogeography, at this time, the major intent was to change the river sources, to move them towards lands that were seen as irrigable, like much of the Salt River Valley and to uh, bring in a lot of uh, industry uh, following, following um, the movement of people into this region. So it was, it was to learn to transform. So that's something that's important to think about when we think about the legacy of science in this region. Oh, this picture is uh, the Colorado Compact being signed nearly 100 years ago today in Santa Fe. That's Herbert Hoover in the center. He was, I think he was at the- Washington? This was in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Yeah, so the representatives from the seven basin states met in Santa Fe in November of 1922, and then they divided the Colorado River at a place called Lee's Ferry in half and said everything south of Lee's Ferry is lower basin, everything north of it is upper basin. Each, one, each side got 7.5 million acre feet of water, and then within that they negotiated further. And there's much, there's a, more of a story to tell about that, especially Arizona's role, but um, it's just to give you an idea of who was at the table. And uh, as you can see, there's no Indian people there, no tribal leaders. And um, there is a clause in the Colorado Compact that refers to Indian water claims, but that is just to say that this agreement doesn't affect the federal government's responsibility to Indian tribes for water. That's all it says. It doesn't quantify or uh, any waters for Indian nations or uh, give them a seat at the table when dividing the rest of the, the river. And that has implications for how we uh, approach water settlements today. So I was going through a lot of the texts uh, from you know, 1911 onward, looking at how water is described and how damming and the transformation of the Colorado River is understood among uh, key Arizona institutions, such as Arizona Highway Magazine. And I found this 1947 edition where they were talking nothing but the, about the Colorado River and the damming of it. And you can see some of this high modernist ideology at work. So here, this was Raymond Carson, a, form, a long time editor of the Arizona Highway Magazine, uh, a quote where he's reflecting on uh, a lot of the engineering and environmental transformation um, with the river. And you can see he's, the, the way that the, the river is framed vis-a-vis uh, -vis settlement, in, especially in Phoenix, but more increasingly around Arizona, is seen as like a man against nature <coughs> type of dichotomy. You say, always over the land is a threat of drought. Several times in recent years, the snows were light, et cetera, et cetera, going down to the bottom. Yes, nature's whims can be circumvented. If man is wise and looks towards the future, both nature and the future are a challenge. Now, overcoming nature, overcoming natural limitations, this was the ideology at the time, and people were acting upon it. In 1911, the Salt River was dammed and Roosevelt Lake, name in honor of Theodore Roosevelt, was erected. The dam stopped the regular flow of the Salt River through Maricopa County and what would become Phoenix, where we stand right now, or where I'm standing, you're all sitting. The dam was one, and I don't know about the other users where they're coming from. The dam was one of the original projects funded in the Reclamation Act. It was one of the greatest physical intrusions on Arizona waters, helping to dry up the once perennial uh, Salt River. The river was the basis of a uh, sorry I can't say this Hohokam civilization, 
the ancestors of Odom people and also the, the Hopi tribe who live, um, who claim an ancestry to Hohokam. And many of these nations live along the Gila River, Salt River, or down even further near the Santa Cruz River in central and southern Arizona. After the signing of the Colorado Compact, California helped pass the Boulder Canyon Act in 1938, the, the basis for the Hoover Dam. By that point, Arizona and California were in entrenched conflict over the waters for the lower basin, divided in the Colorado Compact. Arizona was in fact fighting the compact and its ratification uh, in, sta in Arizona state legislature, but California was already in the process of settling the Colorado River into, uh, and putting it into motion toward en both energy and irrigation with the uh, with, uh, All-American Canal and much of the Imperial Valley and the hydroelectricity generated by the Hoover Dam. And that was one of the main motivations for damming a lot of these rivers was the expansion of, of electricity kind of following the Tennessee R River Valley Authority and, uh, and the model that was being, uh, was being brought forward uh, later on through the New Deal era. Um, so I, here are some pictures of, uh, of uh, the, um, the dams being built. There's um, not only the Roosevelt Dam, but the Coolidge Dam, which dams the Gila River. That's another tributary of the Colorado River south of the Salt River. In an interesting story that I found in, um, in doing some of this archival work was at this Florence Canal. Let me see if I can get the, the laser pointer to work. There we go. It doesn't work on TV. <laughs> the Florence Canal was, uh, was, was actually constructed. It was fun, there was a fundraising by private citizens and it was constructed to divert waters from the Gila River that was going towards the Gila River Indian Nation who had a relationship with the federal government through treaty um, and bringing it to new lands that, um, that a, a, the, the agent in charge of the, the regional BIA agent w had purchased and was selling. So it was a land speculation. He was bringing water to this, to this area now called, it was called Adamsville. It's a ghost town near Florence, Arizona. You can see it, a little placard alongside the road. But that whole area was, was land speculation to enrich this person who was ignoring his responsibilities to the Gila River communities, diverting water that was going to them, and then creating an environmental crisis for them. Then they didn't have water, and it became the federal government's responsibility, not the state of Arizona or the emerging town of Florence, the federal government's responsibility to bring water to the Gila River, especially following the Winters decision of 1908. And so you, the federal government then, with, through the BIA, helped to fund the building of the Coolidge Dam. This is an idealized, it's a model, so it's not actually what it looked like, but a Coolidge Dam, and, um, and that was to create a reservoir to bring water to the Gila River and other communities in that area eventually. And, um, and that dam flooded uh, San Carlos Apache land. So the San Carlos Apache then were, were, were dealing with their lands being flooded, sacred sites being flooded in order to satisfy federal obligation to the Gila River, which was initially a crisis created by this canal in Florence. So you can see how colonialism is layered and built in and, ex exemplif and uh, amplified through, di through new uh, infrastructures that are built over time. And this is a, a New York Times article that I found that was referring to that story. And uh, this is from 1965. And what's interesting to me about this article is not only um, the fact that it's talking about uh, how the, the forecasted reservoirs actually failed. So if you read uh, this highlighted section that I pulled out, as a matter of fact, the Gila River flow figures used by engineers to justify building the dam apparently originated in distant and far wetter, uh, wetter climate for the reservoir has never been completely full and the irrigation potential of 100,000 acres has, has only been half realized. So already we're recognizing that the science is flawed, the ir, ir, engineering estimates are inaccurate, and this is before even CAP is built, right? We're seeing that these, these uh, idealized um, projections of reservoir levels are even in this case, half of what the, they were thinking was gonna be the case. And then it, there's this racist paragraph below, but it's actually kind of referring to 
what if we a ask the Apache people what they think? Maybe they would have given us something uh, uh, else to think about. If one were to ask old timers among the San Carlos Apache tribe on whose reservation the dam uh, and reservoir squat, which is an interesting choice of words, he might get the Apache equivalent of I told you so, for the reservoir floods sacred grounds and the gods cannot be. So, you know, obviously it has this kind of racial, race, racist stereotyping, but, oops, sorry, but it's, um, but it's speaking to the fact that uh, maybe, maybe it's referring to uh, uh, some gripe among uh, people living there that were saying that this dam could never have fulfilled its complete estimates at the time it was uh, constructed and projected and engineered. So that's something to think about. It was still trying to uncover some of these loose threads uh, going around. But in 1968, some nearly 30 years following the passage of the Boulder Canyon Act, the one that created the Hoover Dam, Congress passed the Colorado River Basin Act that created both the funding mechanism and dedicated monies to build the Central Arizona Project. This is, was necessary for the expansion of Phoenix. The future of Arizona was pinned on the construction of this project. The allocation of water to the urbanizing Salt River Valley was defined against the idea of drought. Yet again, the lack of permanent water sources in the Southwest. The construction of CAP took water from the Colorado River into the Salt River Valley. In this way alone, between the years 1911 and 1991, when CAP was finally complete, over a 90 year period, settlers in Arizona massively changed the ecology of the region, stopping up one river and bringing another into its former valley. If you think about it, river used to flow from east to west and then down towards the Colorado River. Now it flows from west to east in the opposite direction from which it used to flow, and it requires massive amounts of energy to do that. To this day, CAP is the largest energy consumer in Arizona. And my wife, Nandaba, and I went to um, Parker Dam recently uh, near uh, south of Lake Havasu City, and we saw where CAP is actually pushed through the Buckskin Mountains. There's a tunnel that was um, dug through the mountain, and then it has to, there's, you can, if you just stand outside and, and listen, there's all sorts of like energy being used. You can actually hear it. it's an ambience in the, re in the area now. Um, that's created by the massive amounts of energy needed to move the water into this area. Uh, this map came out of the Stuart Udall archives at Arizona, University of Arizona, and this was um, made in February of 1967, right before the Colorado um, River Basin Act was passed. And as you can see, the, the whole route is envisioned already going uh, north of Phoenix to near its current route and then down into Tucson. And, um, and actually, I think today, CAP goes a little bit more east of Tucson than, than what's shown on this map. But, um, but what's important for me in my earlier research was this uh, dot up at the top near page, this thermal power plant assumed location. This eventually would become the Navajo Generating Station the largest energy producing uh, entity thing on any Indian reservation, um, 2200 plus megawatts of power, uh, eventually closed down and demolished just a couple years ago, but was the largest carbon em emitter in Indian country for, for many years as well. And that w provided for a time 90% of the power needed to move CAP into um, Phoenix and Tucson. So that energy project was integral to the moving of CAP water into these areas. And that's kind of the basis of a large part of our coal economy in the Navajo Nation. As seen in the formula above here, natural flow, natural flow today, the way that we understand the river, includes these, a lot of these colonial impositions into the rivers and the tributaries, including current rates of consumption and the holding back of waters and evaporation loss and dams. These forms of measurements are made consistent with for cellular temporal conditions to be useful in policy and practice. What is more, these hydrological sciences within the Colorado River are inevitably tied to the projects of transformation. So it's hard to know a naturalness of a river that is heavily, uh, my pages got torn, uh, combined, heavily legislated and diverted through settlement. 
what climate modeling and climate predictions inevitably does is take attention away from actual destruction of the rivers through damming, thinking about how this river was constructed in the way that it is through these dams, diversions, and reservoirs, and that there is nothing of a natural flow that we can say um, exists in the way that we understand naturalness as a word in everyday vernacular and everyday use. So the naturalness is kind of a ruse. It's, an, it's this false idea that there's a natural Colorado River. It's completely uh, changed by all of these dams along the river. And so um, when we're asking questions about climate change and, uh, and future environmental impacts, you know, we're acting as if we're assuming there's a natural river there. That has been completely destroyed by um, these concrete um, structures through the river. So uh, it's probably taboo of me to show uh, <laughs> a cemetery stone, but I looked up, I tried really hard to find a picture of this woman, uh, Gussie Thomas Smith, and I couldn't find anything but this headstone. I think she's buried around here somewhere in Phoenix, but um, she was also part of that 1947 edition of Arizona Highways magazine, and I thought their quote was really provocative. Also it has problematic language, which we can talk about, but she wrote uh, in an essay in that special issue, with incredible audacity, the deed is done. The Colorado has literally been sold down the river and no man living today need fear the slave's revenge, insinuating that the Colorado River is a slave to, to humans. What the victim may be planning to do someday to the Boulder Dam project is of no concern for several generations moving the problem forward. Now we're in that position several generations forward. Th at that time, she's saying, there might be a problem in the future. We don't have to worry about it. Um, but this is kind of indicative of the larger problem that gets pushed down the road. And I, I'll come back to what I think the larger problem is in my final slide. This, uh, th these series of pictures are um, pictures I took uh, 10 years ago today, which is kind of funny that it's um, 2012, 2022, 1922, all of these dates kind of line up. But it was when then Arizona Senators John Kyle and John McCain were proposing a water settlement with, uh, with the Hopi tribe and the Navajo Nation. I took these pictures outside of Tuba City where the Senators had negotiated settlement with the two tribes. What is interesting is the past and existing use of uh, crucial. Oh, sorry, I um, I lost my my page here. What is interesting here is um, how the settlement, which I didn't bring the language of, is conforming water use for the Dene Nation, for the Navajo Nation, and the Hopi tribe to how the Colorado Compact is structured and has been legislated over time, when you talk to water lawyers or you talk to people who, t who, who make policy on it, they often refer to the Colorado Compact and subsequent agreements as a law of the river. It's something that is seen as finalized. And it's, you know, it's built out of that episteme, that theory of knowledge, that ontology that I had been telling you, how, showing you how it was constructed over a 150 year period. Now, what these protesters are, are exemplifying are, is a different kind of thinking of the water. And it's one that is also based on ideals and idealism, like I was saying, and is dismissed because it's idealistic, which means water is life. But what is you know, river and water governance that doesn't have ideal and idealism tied to it? So if we go back to the Theodore Roosevelt quote, if we go back to the Raymond Carson quote, those were all vague ideals, but it had a fundamentally different insinuation of what the what human relationship with the water and nature and the environment was compared to the way that Diné activists are understanding it. So if you build upon principles like to'e'ina and then you create governance and then you create policy from that, it will fundamentally give you a different kind of management of water than when you build it off of ideologies of conquering nature, diverting and damming water for irrigation and for the expansion of colonial capitalism. So that's the main difference that I'm trying to articulate here. Uh, you can see this exemplified in a mural not too far from us, I think. 
uh, in near down ASU downtown. And um, I don't have the whole mural here. It's, it's a pretty long mural. But it's a mural that depicts Phoenix's relationship with water over time and spatially. So in the center are, are important figures of indigenous cosmologies, the indigenous world uh, making. And on the left and right hand side are two different kinds of relationships with the environment. On the right hand side, you have the exploitative relationship, which I've been describing up until now. You have the coal mining, uh, providing power to cap, which is represented in that swirling green hose, bringing water into Phoenix, represented in the form of golf courses. <laughs> so it's like, it's, it's highlighting superficial or non-subsistence non types of uses of water. You don't need golf courses to survive. Um, you can go, you can live in the world without golf courses, but you can't live in the world without food, without um, sheep, uh, traditional agriculture, other kinds of agriculture, and that's exemplified on the other side of the mural. I don't have that picture here. The reason why I, I didn't include the whole mural is because I wanted to show the juxtaposition of two different places. In the background, you will see uh, the Westward Ho building um, kind of looming, um, looming in, in uh, to the sky, or uh, how do you say that? Shooting up into the sky? But that used to be a, a hotel and it was pretty posh. It had like um, uh, ba uh, um, sites for for dancing and holding for uh, like weddings and and other kind of banquets and things like that. Now it's a residential building, and ASU has uh, re has part of it uh, for classrooms. But um, in 1968, when CAP was signed, it was signed in the Westward Ho, and that's a picture of CAP being signed here. Then President Johnson shaking Carl Hayden's hand, and there's. I think Morris Udall in the background, a congressman, and Stuart Udall, uh, Secretary of Interior, all responsible for making CAP and making the Navajo Generating Station and, and part of the coal economy that was supplying power to CAP. So I think it's interesting that these two ideas, the different kinds of ideas of water and water use, are represented spatially near each other. So you have converging and conflicting ideologies in practice and represented in the form of murals, in the form of statements, in the form of sloganeering, and also in the form of law, in the form of uh, policy, um, uh, in the form of press releases and those kinds of things. So that's where our ideas are being debated and then how we act upon those ideas become the way we interact with water and other kinds of natural entities. So when we're getting to, this, to the topic of, the, slide, of the, the, the talk, the title slide, decolonization, what does that mean? I am taking uh, my cues from Tuck and Yang. Um, maybe some of you have read them. Their article, uh, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, was published 10 years ago, too, in 2012. And they were saying that decolonization, uh, when, de decolon when they wrote that, they meant to say it is a landed project, rematriating stolen land. It has to be physical and material as much as ideological, the project of decolonization. This presentation has highlighted the importance of ideology, of how people think about the landscape and then act upon it. What we need to also emphasize is the power of decolonization, notions of sovereignty and jurisdiction. This is my emphasis in the last slide. How could we decolonize the Colorado River? As the talk of the title suggests, we look at the larger project of decolonization historically and in discourse. It is about taking control and instituting new regimes. Post-colonial scholarship emphasized the notions of, of coloniality and how ideas are inherited despite new kinds of control. So if we think about decolonization in Africa in the 1960s, uh, we think about uh, new governments taking over institutions of the state, states that were colonial in origin from the French, from the English, uh, from the Portuguese. And then uh, over the last 50 years, people have cri criticized these nation states for replicating many of the colonial practices of the state being distanced from the people, of being punitive, of being uh, captured by, by extractive industries or other, kind of, of uh, other kinds of interests. And that is what they mean by coloniality, is the way you think about things can also be inherited, even if new people are taking over, they're still perpetuating the same kind of practices. So 
So uh, in other words, it matters not whether a business is under new management, if the thing that it is selling is destructive. To move toward decolonization is also to think about new kinds of water regimes in the West, ones that prioritize indigenous political values, emphasize in these ideologies, to'e'ina. Responsibility is emphasis in Diné thinking or in, in other kinds of indigenous uh, ways of uh, ideologies, and that's different from rights. The way that settler colonial societies have constructed uh, private property regimes, have constructed land regimes, have constructed even the, 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 the basic units of capitalism is about rights and property and ownership and not about your responsibility towards things, which is a, a pre-capitalist way of thinking. So if we think about the Colorado River in terms of responsibility, what would that portend for how we interact with it? Would that make us think about, okay, we need the restoration of certain kinds of ecologies? near the mouth of the Colorado River and, and the Gulf of California. If that was a responsibility that we in Arizona, in California, Nevada, and even moving into Utah, emphasize what kinds of practices would follow from that kind of thinking, making sure that the, the species, uh, the amphibians, the uh, axodotls, and other kinds of creatures that, that are unique to that area have enough access to water. Those are the kinds of, uh, those are the kinds of political projects that have become possible when you decolonize your way of thinking. So I'll stop there and take questions. <laughs> wow, thank you so much, Dr. Curley. Um, there's a lot to think about in that presentation, and I was really struck by it when you were talking about the Colorado River not being natural, and also how different I ideologies are dictating the policies we have, but they're all based on an ideology. So that was really interesting. Um, we're gonna go ahead and take questions from the audience now. So. Um, I'd like to open it up to our in-person audience as well as invite our live stream audience to submit questions in the chat or using the form in the chat, uh, whichever one is easier for you. Um, so yeah, do we have any questions in the room here? We can give it a second too for our, our live stream audience to submit a question. Um, but kind of going off off what you were just talking about in your last slide, do you, this idea of, you know, colonization is a mindset and it's something that is kind of deeply embedded in how we think. Do you have thoughts on how do we, can rethink that in our own brains? Like what, what can we do as individuals to kind of get out of that mind frame and deco decolonize our own brains basically? Yeah, I mean, it's about culture and cultural production and, um, and every day, everybody has culture, like, and it's produced in um, media, it's produced in television ads, it's produced in the, the Rappi signs that we were talking about earlier. And, uh, and so it's like this idea of, um, of what, is, you know, what is it that we should be doing? We should be buying things, we should be, um, we should be uh, uh, you know, consuming water, going to fancy restaurants, and, 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 and drinking water without concern of where it's coming from. And so that all has to be kind of instituted in how we think about things every day. Like I was just thinking earlier while I was preparing the presentation here, this house probably predates CAP. I don't know when this house was built, but like how were people uh, even before CAP was built thinking about water and water use, water, the finite, finiteness of water. Um, if you're drawing from groundwater, if you're drawing from aquifer water, there's often more care in thinking in thinking about what you're using your water for. If you if you take into consideration its finite nature, and our cultural production throughout Phoenix, throughout Tucson, through much of the Southwest or the Western states, can include Denver. You can include Salt Lake City. These places see finite. Uh, see, sorry, water as this unlimited resource that comes from nowhere. And so those kinds of um, ideas have to be challenged and they can be challenged in public education, they could be challenged in school. I mean, I end up talking about things, these things after people are 18 and going to college, so it's kind of a, you know, it's getting them late in thinking about uh, resources and water use, but you know, these kinds of things can be taught earlier at an early age. Indoctrination is what I'm asking, basically. <laughs> 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 oh. and do you have a question? I'm going to well, I, I have something no, to say. Um, I went to a, a, another lecture last week about uh, what, how uh, Phoenix was organized on the City Beautiful plan. And in 1901, um, 
it was built mostly along the Hohokam Con canals. Mm. And trees were a part of that land. This, you know, this would have been, uh, all, those, all the streets were, when, after a while when infrastructure changed and canal, the larger canal systems, the CAP and things like that started to happen, then streets had to be widened, trees went away. Mm -hmm. um, the only vestige we have is up on the, uh, on central north, along, um, north of Camelback and, and up through Bethany Helm where you have that, that vestige of that plan. Oh, okay. And the whole thing was talking about how do we plan for, for trees and plants again that will populate mm -hmm. that kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. um, in, in my neighborhood, I see yeah. that people are putting plastic grass in. Oh, that's, that's better <laughs> 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 than water intensive grass, yeah. I guess. So, um, so I guess there are a lot of ways that practically where we live now, here in this area particularly, you're gonna have to start dealing with that idea of what is our relationship to the water mm -hmm. and how is our culture impeding um, Yeah. That I, the lack of, like you said, connection with drinking water out of the bottle and, and where it comes from. I think, yeah, when we're talking specifically about Phoenix, and, but we can extend that thinking to Southern Arizona as well, we can think about like an original contradiction and that's uh, overuse of water um, and, and people planning on building in places where there's not enough water. That's a contradiction we've been faced with here for, for a long time. And you know, when I was pointing out the Roosevelt Dam, that was a dam designed to um, address that conflict early on, uh, 1911, and earlier, uh, people like Carl Hayden, who had a crossing near Tempe, which is you know where ASU is based now, but that used to be all like agriculture land, and Hayden had diversions and water, and was actually fairly prosperous. And people downstream were would get annoyed by upstream diversions. Uh, Mesa had a canal. There's the Arizona Canal that goes um, uh, north. Um, was that direction northwest and um, and there was a lot of Mormon settlements there near Mesa and so you had these conf uh, con conflicting communities all throughout this region drawing upon the limited Salt River and its ground and its aquifers and and there was already kind of uh, disagreements fights even people you know reading in the record they like to highlight some of the more um, you know ex like the things that seem Western, like people coming up with guns and telling people to shut down their diversions or, you know, their dams. And yeah, they had that kind of idea. So there's like these accounts of people confronting each other with guns. But that speaks to this original contradiction, right? There's not enough water for the water uses of all these people coming in, all these settlers. And, um, and, uh, and so they created the, Res the Roosevelt Dam, which would hold back years worth of water supply build up a reservoir which then can meet more demand. But that demand is always increasing, it's always growing, it's never satisfied. So then you need cap, and then you need another thing, and to, to the point where you start to run out of water, which is the case that we're at today. So going back to that original contradiction, more than about 150 years ago, that's what needs to be addressed, right? How do people use water? How do they think about where their water is coming from? And how do they conserve it? Ultimately, it's a it's a conservative way of thinking. It's a conservation idea. So, yeah. So we have a few questions that came into the chat, and um, I'll ask them in order, sort of. So we have a few from Steve, and some of his questions you've you've already kind of addressed in your responses. But can we rethink our relationship to our with water? And what are the possibilities would we imagine that could have an impact on our supply and use of decreased availability of water for Arizona? Also. How might we promote the idea of minimizing golf courses? So kind of that <laughs> and it's backyard swimming thing. holes and all that. Yeah. <laughs> Take up other sports. <laughs> <laughs> There's other things you can do <laughs> with your time, I guess. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, it's it's an industry that's been supported by uh, Central Arizona. It's a big part of the tourism, the appeal. Right. So you want to think about I mean, there's just like small steps you have to take along the way. 
um, in order, I think, I, I mean, I'm speculating. I, I, I've just done research on the history of the, the Colorado River and, um, and how indigenous people have been I impacted, but I haven't, I don't really know too much except through just my own guesses about how you can make those changes in Phoenix. You know, that's where you get policy people that are maybe seriously talking about water issues. So I think making a political demand that have like real and realistic conversations about water is one starting point. For example, like during the, the primary, um, you know, we were just in an election year. And during the primary season, there was one of the Republican senator candidates. I don't think it's the, the guy who ended up going up for Senate. Was Blake Masters, was that his name? The Republican guy? Uh, there was another guy who was saying, what we're going to do to solve our water pro uh, crisis is we're going to create a canal from the Mississippi River <laughs> all the way over to Arizona. And it's like another, kind of, that's a fantastical solution. That's fantasy. That's never going to happen. That's not a serious conversation. That's not a serious way of starting the conversation. But that's what's being, you know, said in the media. That's what's going on over commercials and in the major news or, you know, the local news stations. And so I think, you know, just encouraging people to have serious conversations about water is a good starting point. Great. And we have a question from Lindsay. Are there any current examples of decolonization happening now regarding the river? That's a good question. Um, a lot of people like to point to, um, recent changes in uh, New Zealand and how the river was given rights and, and uh, there's rights to the river uh, and I'm, I'm failing to remember the name of that because it's 50 minutes into the, <laughs> into the presentation and then my mind starts to slip a little bit but that's an example a lot of people point to um, so I think that um, even just looking at uh, riparian models and seeing what we can get out of those might be useful I mean they're not too far um, afield from existing law. They're actually law that's in practice in states and um, in other places. And, and really working to jettison these Western water notions. I think we can start to develop a community of water users in California, Co uh, Colorado, Utah, and Arizona that think about shared governance and not about um, having rights to appropriation, which has been the basis of the water law up until now. Having water budgets even, you know, that's something that people talk about and put forward. So there are, there are ideas out there that people are talking about. And um, it's getting out of the mindset though that the, that the Colorado Compact, the law of the river, is something that is inevitable, that is finalized, and as concrete as the dams that are constructed around it. I think there's almost an aesthetic issue involved where like, you see a dam, you look at the Hoover Dam, you look at, um, at, um, um, at the Glen Canyon Dam or Parker Dam, and you see these huge concrete manifestations with these like um, New Deal Art Deco kind of designs, and it's like man conquering nature, you know, that you can see the ideology in the construction, in the architecture. And it makes this, it, it gives you an impression of permanence, like these dams can never be removed. They're so, they're so large and they're so imposing. And I think that, that helps to keep the idea that the law of the river is a permanent thing in people's minds. And it discourages people from thinking of alternatives. And I think that's where we need to say, hey, these dams can be removed as much as they can be built. And um, the river laws can be transformed based on what people agree upon. You know, you, this generation wasn't around in 1922. Why do we have to be beholden to a compact that was signed and excluded uh, really important interests to the river? We don't have to be. It's just because we, the way that the institutions work and replicate themselves, you know, that, that these uh, laws continue to be in practice. Great. We are getting quite a few questions in the chat, so I just want to turn to the in-person audience before we go over there. Hi, Dr. Curley. <laughs> I'm going to hide my water bottle. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I, I know that you've been having conversations with other people who are both um, indig well, indigenous peoples from different backgrounds. And in your research for this um, presentation, but also just in your continuing conversations with people about this topic, um, particularly indigenous peoples, what has stood out the most, but also um, in what has been surprising to you about some of the conversations that there are, or the issues that they seem to keep on coming to, or coming against. Uh, 
I'm really interested, intrigued about just what you've been talking about, or how you've been talking about this with other people. Um, uh, the Chimaweve or the Salt River people um, in, in mm -hmm. the recent days? Yeah, I think that um, uh, what, what's important for the nations along the Colorado River um, is, is something that actually I would like more conversations. Uh, I would like to have more conversations with those people. I haven't really have been able to draw, upon, draw out kind of their principles and their larger uh, identities with the river and with the, with the water. And it's different from us as Diné people who we have a relationship with, um, with different uh, waters. They are place names a lot. If you go throughout the Navajo Nation, there's um, springs that are used or, or, or rivers or creeks or they, these become place names and like the sources of water are known and those are generated by aquifers or then the, the surface waters are things that are contribute to the Colorado River. It's a different kind of ecology and different kind of indigenous knowledge than if you go to the Chimaweva, <laughs> I have always have I have a hard time with that, or the or any of the the tribes along the um, Colorado River. And I think um, including the Colorado River Indian tribe, I think these are the nations that need to be consulted and thought about and in and, and uh, asked about the, the, their identity and their, their uses of the water. I know they have very particular histories. Some of their lands have been flooded by, uh, by, the, by some of these dams, right? And they've had to deal with that. Uh, they have limited water uses and water rights that come out of the state's allocation, just like all the other nations. So even though their identities are intricately bound to the river, their status because of the Colorado compact is one of another user with less rights than the state governments that uh, claim uh, their, their territories as part of their state, um, their state jurisdictions. And so those are the important things that um, need to come forward is, uh, is to draw out their principles of governance, how their identity with the water, with the river especially, have come to inform how they relate with it and how they interact with it. So. Uh, that more research has to be done along those lines. <laughs> In other words, I'm taking your question and thinking about other questions, <laughs> but not answering it. So that's what, that's what I do to fill time. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a great question and good response. Um, so we are a few minutes past seven. Maybe we can take one or two more questions from sure. the chat. Um, Marilyn is asking, um, the Watershed Management Group in Tucson is creating what they call hydro-local solutions. How could this type of community-based approach be helpful or not to our attempt to cope with the climate crisis? Um, yeah, that's a great that's a great uh, um, idea. Uh, hydro local. I think that is like I don't know enough about what's going. I mean, I live in Tucson, but I don't know n enough about this group and their project. But I will say what is interesting is uh, to what I think is an emphasis. What I'm trying to do is disaggregate the river. Meaning, like, we talk about the river as if it's a whole thing. I talked about in the, the beginning of this uh, project. And that wholeness has changed over time. The Colorado River has changed names. It's changed origin points. I was just re reading a, um, an old uh, a book from uh, the 1911 book. And they were saying the origin of the Colorado River as of the confluence of the Green and the Grand River in south uh, <coughs> eastern Utah. And that is n not commonly known as the origin point of the Colorado River today. Now it goes further north into Colorado uh, near Rocky Mountain National Park. So even our idea of the river has changed over time. And that I think is a political thing to include Colorado into the Colorado River, give it more of a stake in the dividing of it. And um, I went to a conference in uh, Fort Collins not too long ago where they were just talking about how terrible the lower basin users are and saying that all the upper basin users are, are managing water responsibly and it's all the lower basin users who are over allocating. And I became somewhat defensive, even though I've been critiquing this whole thing. I'm like, <laughs> wait, why am I defending the lower basin? But, um, but it, was, it was interesting because, um, because they, they were talking like they owned the whole Colorado River in Colorado. And, and at one point, uh, one of the presenters was saying, 
going to giving a historical overview of the river, saying that the Colorado legislature named the Colorado River. Like they put that in law to name the whole thing the Colorado River and give it its current boundaries in order to insinuate that the Colorado state has a strong claim in the Colorado River. All of this is to say that everybody's thought about the river as this long one thing that can be divided and then uh, in by these seven arbitrary jurisdictions. You think about this, how these states are divided. They're not responding to natural landscape. They're just latitude and longitudinal lines, perfect squares in some cases on a map. And so these are kind of absurd ideas of space that then get gain weight in how you distribute the waters. And the whole ecology and the whole management of the river is thought about at this aggregate scale. So getting back to the question, when you disaggregate it, when you think about that water as something unique mm -hmm. where it's at and not as part of this larger system that needs to be managed, and it can be managed maybe at a, at a better, it better at a local scale, then you might have uh, better uses, new kinds of unique kinds of conservation uh, approaches. Not every landscape is the same. If you look at um, uh, the a lot of the pictures that you see of the Colorado River, focus on when it goes through the canyons, like through canyon country, through like Grand Canyon and south of north of there. That's where you have these like really dramatic views of the, of the river. And that's what people often think about when they think about the Colorado River. But you go down into Mexico or you go up into Colorado or you go into Utah, very different kinds of environments in each of these places. And so the solutions would often have, would almost by definition need to be unique to those places. So maybe that can be a template for how you can have um, specific local kinds of environmental conservation. That was great. Um, I think we'll wrap up with this last question from Paulina. Um, and it, it is, again, something that you've kind of touched on with your responses, but what can people do to decrease their impact on the water supply, but really, do you think people are ready to change their daily lives to do it? <laughs> are they ready? Um, well, that's a hard question to answer. Um, I, th I would say optimistically, yes. I think that, um, yeah, and I'll just answer the second part of the question. I think, you know, when you spend a lot of time in these archives, when you spend a lot of time reading the words of past generations, you then recognize how their understanding the world is different from how we colloquially understand it when we're just talking. I mean, people are attuned to sustainability, environmental conservation, they're attuned to some of these things that people weren't even talking about 100 years ago. So I think the, the, I, the ideas have changed enough where people today can be ready for that. They just need to not be holding to the ghosts of dead generations, as <laughs> Mark said. Sorry, I'm just going to throw in a Mark's quote. Or like, we're beholden by the ghosts of, pa uh, not Christmas past, but <laughs> 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 it's a Christmas season. But they're taught, you know, yeah. but what he's referring to is this idea that institutions kind of have this logic that self-perpetuate onto new generations, even though they're the ideas of past generations. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, you, you, I think it's, it's not that people aren't ready, it's just that they need to be ready to challenge those institutions, to change the law of the river, to even abandon the Colorado Compact, which is heresy uh, in, in today's water discourse. Everybody says the Colorado Compact's there forever. It's a hard working document. They have all sorts of kind of, they animate it with like human qualities. <laughs> it's, it's just a law that's, that, that is, uh, that's racist and that's, that's outdated. And yet it has all of this kind of like tie to the people who use it and practice it. And water lawyers are just really, um, really all about it and knowing its history, which I'm interested in knowing its history too, but in order to challenge it, not to, to reaffirm it. Anyway, okay, that's our last question. <laughs> that was All our right. last Thank question. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Curley. That was great. And that wraps up our presentation tonight, folks. I don't know where this is coming from. Arrowhead. <laughs>